We spend a lot of time talking offense and quarterbacks, but it is, as you said, defense wins championships. Bob Miller just so fast that they don't have the answer. I've always found this phrase fascinating. Defense wins championships. The NFL is constantly making rule changes to make the game more offensive, to appeal to a larger audience and player safety. After all, the casual fan is most likely going to want to see a high-scoring shootout as opposed to a low-scoring stalemate. But there is something to be said about a dominant defense. As a Browns fan, I've been accustomed to watching lousy defenses over the years, but 2023 has been different. Miles Garrett, devastation here in Indianapolis. To watch that unit play with confidence, swarm to the ball, and just flat out dominate has truly been one of the most entertaining things to witness as a fan. So today, I thought it'd be interesting to briefly look at every number one defense since 2010 and see how their seasons played out. But really quickly, this video is sponsored by SeatGeek. So we're halfway through the NFL season, which as a Browns fan has been wild. And with many of the best games left on the schedule, SeatGeek, the best place to buy tickets, is giving you a special discount to make sure that you don't miss any of the action. I have a special deal for you, whether you're a new SeatGeek customer or not. You can use code KTO10 for 10% off any college or professional football game on SeatGeek. Code KTO10 is different than my previous code. It works no matter how many times you've bought in tickets using SeatGeek before. And this code KTO10 is going to get you 10% off your next football order. So take out your phone, open the SeatGeek app, and add code KTO10 for your account. And you better do it now because this offer is only available until November 30th. In 2010, the Pittsburgh Steelers had the number one defense in the NFL. Jermaine is in the line. They gave up the least amount of points, the second fewest yards, and forced the third most turnovers. Mike Tomlin himself admitted just how scary this unit was. If, like, what are you talking about? Like, you're talking about a bar fight, you're talking about football. That 10 group created the player safety initiative. <laughs> <laughs> With guys like James Harrison, Troy Polamalu, Brett Kiesel, and Lamar Woodley, these guys bullied around teams on their way to a 12 and four finish. Polamalu won Defensive Player of the Year, and showed just how badly this defense missed him back in 2009 when he was out most of the season due to injury. Their offense, despite dealing with injuries, still ranked out decently and certainly did enough to complete this roster as a Super Bowl contender. In the playoffs, they gutted out wins versus the Ravens and the Jets before losing to the Packers in the Super Bowl. And to be fair, that Packers squad had one of the top defenses in football that year, as well as Aaron Rodgers nearing his prime. They forced the Steelers to commit three turnovers, including a pick six that helped them jump out to a big lead early. 2011, while the Steelers ranked number one in scoring defense, the Niners only gave up two more points and forced 23 more turnovers making them the best defense in 2011. This Niners squad was second in points allowed, fourth in yards allowed, had the most forced turnovers, had the best rush defense, and allowed the least amount of points per possession. This 3-4 run-stuffing defense was built out with the likes of Navarro Bowman, Patrick Willis, Justin Smith, Dante Hittner, Deshaun Golson, and Carlos Rogers. Five of those dudes made a Pro Bowl, and that didn't even include rookie Alden Smith, who had 14 sacks, and finished second in Defensive Rookie of the Year voting. Their offense led by Alex Smith finished 11th in scoring, making this one of the best rosters in football. And the 2011 Niners finished 13 and three. In the playoffs, after surviving an insane fourth quarter with the Saints, the Niners went on to host the Giants, which went into overtime, and there the Giants kicked the game-winning field goal. 2012, in two years, the Seahawks had gone from a defensive liability to the Legion of Boom. Amazingly, most of their impactful defensive players, Richard Sherman, Earl Thomas, Bobby Wagner, Cam Chancellor, and KJ Wright, were all 24 years and younger. They had just come out of nowhere to dominate. You know that mantra, look good, feel good, play good? I've never seen this phrase ring more true than with the Seahawks. They made their big uniform switch going into the 2012 season, which I think most would agree was a massive upgrade. And even though they made the playoffs in 2010, this was their first winning record finish in five years. So anyway, this defense forced a lot of turnovers. Teams struggled to move the ball against them, and they ranked number one in points allowed. 
With a run-heavy offense and surprising quarterback play from rookie Russell Wilson, this team finished 11-5, earning them a spot in the wild card. Once they got there, they defeated the Redskins in the game where RG3 got injured. And then in the divisional round, after falling behind 27-7, they came all the way back to take the lead with 31 seconds to go. But they gave up a drive and game-winning kick. This is one of the few times that the Falcons saved themselves from choking. Now, even though the Seahawks lost, we're not done talking about them yet. 2013. The Seattle Seahawks took everything that they were doing the year before and simply made it better. They had gone from great in 2012 to all-time dominant in 2013. This team featured a pass defense that made opponents cry themselves to sleep. Amazingly, they only allowed one team during the regular season to pass for over 300 yards, and most of those games were under 200 yards. They ranked first in points allowed, yards allowed, and turnovers forced. And with an offense that improved as well, this team finished 13-3 and, and looked like the team to beat in the NFC. In the playoffs, they stifled the Saints until the fourth quarter and held on for the win. In the NFC title match versus the tough 49ers, who also had a dominant defense, the Seahawks battled from behind most of the contest, till finally taking the lead in the fourth quarter and holding off the Niners late. Then in the Super Bowl, in the battle of the number one offense and the number one defense, the defense prevailed in blowout fashion. 2014. Once again, the Seahawks prevailed with the top defense in football, although not quite as dominant as the year before. Don't get me wrong though, that was going to be nearly impossible to replicate. While they forced turnovers at a much lower rate, they still stifled opponents from moving the ball and scoring at a high rate. Amazingly, Bobby Wagner missed five games and was still an MVP candidate in 2014. It's already rare enough for a defensive player to be in this conversation, let alone missing games. Their offense also slowed down a tad in 2013, but still ranked out in the top 10, and the Seahawks finished 12-4 heading into the postseason. After dominating versus a young Cam Newton and Carolina, the Packers jumped out to a 16-0 lead on the Seahawks almost instantly, but Seattle clawed their way back into the game, and after it went into overtime, a huge touchdown pass from Russell Wilson to Jermaine Kearse sent the Seahawks to their second straight Super Bowl appearance. With a 24-14 lead over New England in the fourth quarter, with the best defense in football, Brady overcame two interceptions to rally New England back in the game, and they took the lead with just under seven minutes to go. But infamously, Seattle got down to the goal line and were a yard away from taking the lead and winning their second Super Bowl in a row, only to have their hearts shattered. Sherman's face says it all. 2015. After three seasons as the clear number one defense in football, now in 2015, things weren't so obvious. Seattle once again led the NFL in points allowed, but by just a slim margin. And their lack of turnovers, like the 2013 squad, made it less convincing that this was the best defense in the NFL. After looking at more metrics, the Denver Broncos had the best defense in 2015. Over the course of two years, the Broncos went from a historically dominant offense to a mediocre one. Manning's neck injury had finally caught up with him, and he struggled mightily to throw the ball at all. He was periodically benched for Brock Osweiler, who was okay at times, I guess. Because their offense turned the ball over at a high rate, their defense had to prevent people from moving the ball consistently, which they excelled at, ranking number one in yards allowed. This defense stifled opponents. Most teams struggled to move the ball against them, and their secondary was loaded with Chris Harris Jr. and Aqib Tlaib at corner and their pass rush was deadly with Von Miller and Demarcus Ware. The 2015 Broncos managed to finish the regular season 12-4. After a field goal contest versus the Steelers in the divisional round, the Broncos took the lead late and held on for the win. Then after holding the Patriots to 12 points through most of the game, the Patriots scored a touchdown with 12 seconds left and had to get the two-point conversion to tie things up. Here's Brady. Rolling out, rolling and throwing, it's tipped in the air, and it's intercepted! Facing the league MVP and a dominant defense, the Broncos shut down Cam Newton. The Broncos only managed 194 offensive yards, but they forced four turnovers. 
including Von Miller's big-time strip sacks, leading them to hoisting the Lombardi Trophy. 2016 2016 is a year that is not entirely clear who the best defense was. The debate would come down between the Broncos and the Patriots, and you can make a case for either. The Patriots are statistically the best defense, but this was heavily aided by the fact that their offense was a juggernaut that hardly turned the ball over, whereas the Broncos performed slightly below them statistically, but their offense sucked. They had the number one pass defense. However, their rush defense was mediocre, and they missed the playoffs anyway, so we will focus on the Patriots. Overall, this was just as complete a team as we've seen in the last decade. Three complementary units working together so well that they constantly made things look easy. That 2016 coaching staff alone produced five head coaches not named Bill Belichick. And although this defense had Devin McCourty and Dante Hightower making the Pro Bowl, it was really just a complete and well-balanced unit. The Patriots' way, as some might say. This was the year that Brady missed four games due to the Deflategate suspension, but once he returned, they just mowed through most of their schedule on a way to a 14-2 finish. In the postseason, they absolutely dominated the Texans and Steelers on their way to making the Super Bowl for the second time in three years. This Super Bowl was another number one offense versus number one defense, which is always cool to see. And almost immediately, it looked like the Falcons offense was too much to stop. Everything went wrong for the Patriots, right up until the end of the third quarter. That's when we witnessed the most improbable comeback in Super Bowl history. I don't think anyone's gonna stop making fun of the Falcons over this one. 2017, the Jacksonville Jaguars, after seemingly being in a rebuild for a decade, finally started to show the fruits of their suffering. Years of hitting on defensive draft picks had paid off, and this became the scariest defensive unit in the blink of an eye. The Jags possessed a staggering six Pro Bowl defensive players that year, highlighted by All-Pros Calais Campbell and Jalen Ramsey. This team was fast, extremely talented, and talked a ton of trash. And they ranked out in the top two or three in most defensive categories. Their offense complemented their defense nicely, as they ran the ball very well, and Bortles was at least average. So the Jags went on to finish 10-6, and six, good enough to host a wildcard game. After holding the Bills to three points in a defensive battle, the Jags shocked the football world when they traveled to Pittsburgh. They jumped out to a 28-7 lead after Telvin Smith had a scoop and score, and they managed to do just enough to hold off a furious comeback attempt by the Steelers. This meant that one year after finishing 3-13, the Jags were playing Tom Brady for a chance to advance to the Super Bowl. Crazy enough, they had a very good shot of winning the game as they held a 10-point lead midway through the fourth quarter. But like we saw Tom Brady do versus the Seahawks a few years back, it doesn't matter how good your defense is. And two late touchdowns capped this one off. Still crazy to think that we were a few plays away from a Blake Bortles and Nick Foles Super Bowl. But anyways, the Jags quickly fell back into obscurity after this game. 2018. After arguably the biggest trade of the offseason, the Chicago Bears acquired one of the best defensive players in the game, Khalil Mack, from the Raiders. Their defense was a top 10 unit the year before, but with the addition of Mack, they became impenetrable. Kyle Fuller, Eddie Jackson, and Khalil Mack all earned first-team honors, as this defense forced more turnovers than anybody, and they gave up the least amount of points. Under new head coach Matt Nagy, the offense looked innovative with Mitch Trubisky, who made a Pro Bowl that year. And with a top 10 offense to complement that best defense in football, the Bears finished 12-4 and, and looked like a force in the NFC. In a old-school classic defensive battle, Nick Foles led a touchdown drive late to take a one-point lead. But the Bears were able to get into field goal range. Then this happened. And oh, he hits the upright again! That's impossible! The Bears' season's going to end on a double doink. 2019. Coming off a Super Bowl victory, the 2019 Patriots rivaled their 2016 squad with another incredibly well-balanced roster. Although this year, Brady's performance was down, and their defense was better than they were in 2016. Good luck trying to pass on these guys, as they had nearly double the amount of interceptions as touchdowns thrown on them. Stephon Gilmore had emerged as not only the top corner, but the best defensive player in football that year. Gilmore, along with Devin McCourty and J.C. Jackson, 
combined for 16 interceptions together, which helped this defense force the second most turnovers in the league, as well as give up the least amount of points and yards. This team was so dominant that through their first seven games in 2019, they were 7-0 with an average winning margin of 25 points. They cooled off a bit, but still finished 12-4 heading into the playoffs. After drawing historic comparisons, this team was shockingly upsetted in the wild card by the Tennessee Titans. Derrick Henry rushed for 182 yards, and Brady's final pass of his Patriots career was a pick six to Logan Ryan. The Patriots have never been the same since. 2020, this was a bizarre year to say the least. Football-wise, there was no preseason and no fans for most of the games. It made the games feel like scrimmages. But with that said, the Rams had been building around Aaron Donald for years, and 2020 was when everything came together for them defensively. They had traded for All-Pro Jalen Ramsey the year before, who continued to play at an elite level. And with that massive star power, along with guys like Leonard Floyd, John Johnson, and Troy Hill, this defense finished number one in points allowed and yards, with a top three rush defense as well as the top pass offense. However, their offense had hit some road bumps. Goff hadn't looked the same since their Super Bowl loss two years prior. He has a tendency to leave the ball inside, and, and he did there. I mean, it was just not a good throw at all. And as a whole, this offense held them back from being a special team, and their defense showed out as expected, as they jumped out to a 17-point lead, which included a pick six, and they went on to win. But they ran out of fuel in Green Bay as Aaron Rodgers worked this defense, and the Rams' offense stalled out. 2021, only one team managed to hold opponents to less than five yards of play, which also happened to be the number one team in points allowed, the Buffalo Bills. It was clear that Josh Allen was a bona fide superstar by this point, after leading them to the AFC Championship the year before. But now, this defense was much improved. Their secondary, featuring all-pro Jordan Poyer, as well as Micah Hyde and Tredavious White, ranked out as the number one pass defense in the league. And overall, this team didn't win off of any huge star defensive players, but more as a combined effort, as nobody had more than seven sacks and just one guy had over 100 combined tackles. Good defenses has a lot of individual stars. Great defenses play on one string. Mm. It's a shoestring. And when you pull it from the bottom, that's when you tighten it up. Interestingly enough, despite finishing with the third highest scoring offense, and the number one scoring defense, they only finished 11 and six. The Bills began to build a reputation as a knockout artist. They could absolutely blow out teams, but also lay a complete dud. When it came to the first round of the playoffs, they absolutely destroyed the Patriots, which had to feel good for Bills fans after two decades of seeing the Patriots success. Then in one of the best playoff games in recent memory, the Bills and Chiefs went into overtime after the most insane final two minutes of a fourth quarter possibly ever. Then after the Chiefs marched down in overtime and got a touchdown to win, this led to playoff rule changes, which now allows both teams in the playoffs to possess the ball no matter what. 2022, this was truly a huge what if year for the 49ers. After Trey Lance and Jimmy G got injured for the year, they had to rely on their rookie, Mr. Irrelevant, to lead them under center, which turned out shockingly well. But a lot of their success was aided by just how dominant their defense was. The stars on this defense shined the brightest. Nick Bosa had 18 and a half sacks as he went on to win Defensive Player of the Year. Fred Warner was the best linebacker in football. Hufunga was an incredible safety. And overall, they just had big time playmakers everywhere. They ranked out number one in scoring and yards allowed, as well as forced the second most turnovers in the NFL. Despite the constant injuries offensively, the Niners finished 13 and four. In the playoffs, they dominated the Seahawks and then held Dak and the Cowboys to just 12 points to advance to the NFC title game. Then in the heavily anticipated matchup, the Niners once again were struck with horrible luck as Brock Purdy was knocked out early with an elbow injury. Unfortunately, when you get down to your fourth string quarterback, it's gonna to be tough to win regardless of what happens. They went on to get blown out by the Eagles. So overall, of the last 13 top ranked defenses, every single one managed to at least make the playoffs. Five of them reached the Super Bowl, and three of those teams, the 2013 Seahawks, the 2015 Broncos, and the 2016 Patriots, hoisted the Lombardi Trophy. 
I also found it interesting that the second lowest ranked offense in points scored of any of these teams was a part of that 2015 Broncos team, showing that you can overcome a mediocre offense to win it all. Looks like they're going to throw it. Right out of the gun. Three wides. Touchdown. 